Good evening, brothers and sisters. God bless you and thank you for joining us from coast to coast for the American Clergy Leadership Conference's Monday program chosen, where we at this particular time are in a study of the original divine principle, the uh, exposition of the divine principle, corrected to say, and tonight we're really blessed with a wonderful presenter. But uh, before we get there, we need to lay the spiritual foundation. I want to greet everybody, especially on this Easter Monday. He is risen. Nothing holds him in the ground, but he is free now. And he is working his triumph of, of resurrection at this time. So we should always be feeling he is a resurrected and he is alive and he is with us. Uh, help me in uh, bringing up uh, Apostle Glenda Phillips Lee. She is chairwoman for women in ministry of the American Clergy Leadership Conference and has for years blessed Africa with her ministry in Africa. Apostle? Praise God, to God be all the glory. We follow the uh, Julian calendar, the Ethiopian calendar. So our Holy Week started yesterday and Easter is actually the 16th. So to God be all the glory. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we come before you today acknowledging your power and your glory. We reflect on the words, O oh God, of Romans 1, 18 through 21, and we're reminded of the truth of your word and the depth of your need for us. Father, we know that your wrath is revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. We know, God, that we have fallen short of your standards, oh God, and that we are all sinners and need your grace and your mercy. Lord, we also know that you have revealed yourself to us through your creation. So we are without excuse. We see, oh God, your handiwork in everything, oh God, that you have done around us. And Lord, we are awed by your majesty and your power. Father, we pray, oh God, that you would open our eyes to see the truth of who you are. Help us, oh God, to recognize our need for you and to turn to you, oh God, in repentance and faith. Lord, we thank you for your mercy and your grace and for the sacrifice of your son, Jesus. We pray, oh God, that we would be transformed by your love and that we would live lives that honor you and bring glory to your name. Father, we ask, oh God, that you bless the presenter and everyone here, oh God, on this line, that they have ears to hear what the Spirit has to say to the church. Lord, as you prepare your church, oh God, we give you all the glory and honor. Lord, bless those, oh God, that are on their way. We pray, oh God, for the laborers, for truly the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And we thank you, oh God, that we shall fulfill our portion of of responsibility according to your will and not our own. In Jesus' precious name, amen and adieu. Amen, adieu. Thank you so much, Apostle. And thank you also for being so much a regular part of our chosen program. God bless you all tonight. You know, last for the last few weeks, we've covered the first part of the divine principle, the exposition of the principle which of course the main chapters are the principle of creation and then the fall of man, how evil entered the world. And then the, the mission of, of the Messiah and other topics last week. And for several weeks before that, we were blessed to have our national co-chair, Dr. Luan Rouse uh, present on Christology. And so now we're gonna be beginning restoration. And of course, restoration has to have an introduction. And I can think of no finer person to give us that introduction to restoration than Minister Christian Nseka. He is the national co-director or assistant director of the Family Federation for World Peace and Unification's Blessing Ministry. So he is very, very um, knowledgeable about the marriage blessing, which is uh, a really key component to what American Clergy Leadership Conference offers the world. Minister Nseka, would you please take it over tonight? Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Hernandez, for the introduction and Apostle Glenda for the prayer. So uh, I'm going to show you my screen. And Mama Dr. Tanya, thank you. Uh, 
actually Reverend Hernandez, I'm not able to share my screen. Oh, let me. I'm so sorry. Yes, I, that's my 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 bad. One second. Uh, let's see. There we go. You should be able to do it now. Forgive yes. Me. Thank you. <clears throat> Oh. Okay, so uh, like Reverend Ander said, um, the divine principle is first, thank you for having me today. Uh, this is a long presentation, uh, so I'm gonna do it in one shot. I hope you don't mind it being long. I'm sorry about that. Uh, but before we start, uh, we just want to start by saying that the divine principle actually has two major parts, like Reverend Andres explained. <clears throat> Among other things, in the first part, we learned about God's nature, God's ideal, and some of the fundamental principles that God established when he created. So some examples of those principles, uh, like um, um, the, the pair system, that's one, uh, which we learned when you know, we studied about the dual characteristics. Uh, there is also reciprocity, which we learned uh, when we studied about the giving and the receiving action. There is um, portion of responsibility, that's another principle. <clears throat> so we also learned about the four, uh, which basically explains about why God's ideal was not realized. So we learned that due to the fall of Adam and Eve, God actually uh, established some new fundamental principles. I'm, I'm speaking about fundamental principles uh, in order to restore the severed relationship between him and human beings. <clears throat> so some of these principles are like the principles of restoration, um, the principle of resurrection, which we studied uh, in chapter five, and also the principle three in the, of restoration, three indemnity, we're gonna start that today, and the foundation of faith, the foundation of substance, all that. Uh, so uh, in a sense, applying um, these principles of restoration, as well as the principles of creation, actually allow us, allows us to create the foundation upon which to receive salvation through the Messiah. So today, since we finished already uh, the first part, today we're gonna start the second part, which in which we will introduce, uh, we will uh, like, so the second part introduces, if I can say, um, God, how God has been working with human beings. Basically that's what we're gonna see today. So, Let's start our presentation. <clears throat> so introduction to restoration. So the, uh, the providence of restoration. The providence of restoration refers to God's work to restore human beings to our original and fallen state so that we may fulfill the purpose of creation. Human beings fell from the top of the growth stage and have been held under Satan's dominion. So to restore human beings, God works to cut off Satan's influence. For this, we must have the original sin removed by being born anew through the Messiah, the true parent. Hence, we fallen people first need to go through a course to separate Satan from ourselves. We do this in order to restore ourselves in form to the spiritual level which Adam and Eve had reached before the fall at the top of the growth stage. So on this foundation, we are to receive the Messiah and be reborn, thereby removing our original sin and being fully restored to the original state of human beings before the fall. Finally, by following the Messiah, we should continue our growth to maturity where we can fulfill the purpose of creation. Since the providence of restoration is God's work of recreation, which has as its goal, the fulfillment of the purpose of creation, God works this providence in accordance with his principle. In the course of the providence of restoration, this principle is called the principle of restoration. So 
the principle of restoration through indemnity. <clears throat> Before discussing the principle of restoration through indemnity, we must first understand in what position, due to the fall, human beings came to stand in relation to both God and Satan. If the human, if the first human ancestors had not fallen, but had reached perfection and became one in heart with God, then they would have lived relating only with God. However, due to their fall, they joined in a kinship of blood with Satan. Hence, immediately after the fall, they found themselves in the midway position, a position between God and Satan, where they were relating with both. As a consequence, all their descendants are also in the midway position, separating Satan from fallen people. How does God separate Satan from fallen people who stand in the midway position? A fallen person will go to God's side if he or she makes good conditions and to Satan's side if he or she makes evil conditions. For example, when Adam's family when Adam's family was in the midway position, God in instructed the children, Cain and Abel, to offer sacrifices so that they might come into a position where God could work his providence through them. Yet, because Cain killed Abel, the condition was made which allowed Satan to claim them instead. What is restoration through indemnity? When someone has lost his original position or state, he must make some, he or she must make some condition to be restored to it. The making of such conditions of restoration is called indemnity. For example, to recover lost reputation, position, or health, one must make the necessary effort or pay the due price. Suppose two people who once loved each other come to be on bad terms. They must make some condition of reconciliation before the love they previously enjoyed can be revived. We call this process of restoring through the original, restoring the original position and state through making conditions restoration through indemnity. And we call the condition made a condition of indemnity. God's work to restore people to their true unfallen state by having them fulfill indemnity conditions is called the providence of restoration through indemnity. Types of indemnity conditions. How does a condition of indemnity compare with the value of what was lost? We can answer by, list, by listing the following three types of indemnity conditions. The first, is to fulfill a condition of equal indemnity. In this case, restoration is achieved by making a condition of indemnity at, price, at a price equal to the value of what was lost when one departed from the original position or state. Acts of restitution or compensation are indemnity conditions of this type. Life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. In Exodus chapter 21, from verse 23 to 24, refers to this type of indemnity condition. The second is, the, is to make a condition of lesser indemnity. In this case, restoration is achieved by making a condition of indemnity at a price less than the value of what was lost. The outstanding example of this is redemption through the cross. We just celebrated Easter yesterday, Apostle Glenda will be celebrating it next Sunday. So that's one example of indemnity of lesser, of no condition of indemnity of that, that lesser indemnity condition. So merely by fulfilling a small indemnity condition of faith in Jesus, we receive the much greater grace of salvation, of salvation which entitles us to participate with Jesus in the same resurrection. By making the indemnity condition of baptism by water, we can be spiritually born anew through Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Furthermore, by taking a piece of bread and a cup of wine at the sacrament of Holy Communion, 
we receive the precious grace of partaking in Jesus's body and blood. The third is to make a condition of greater indemnity. When a person has failed to meet a condition of lesser indemnity, he must make another indemnity condition to return to the original state. This time at a price greater than the first. For example, because Abraham made a mistake when offering the sacrifice of a dove, Abraham and Heifer, he had to meet a condition of greater indemnity to rectify his failure. God thus asked him to offer his only son, Isaac, as a sacrifice. In the days of Moses, when the Israelites failed to believe in God's promise during their 40 days of spying in the land of Canaan, they had to fulfill a condition of greater indemnity by wandering in the wilderness for 40, day, 40 years. So when an indemnity condition is set up for the second time, why is a condition of greater indemnity necessary when indemnity condition is set up for the second time? It is because whenever a central figure in God's providence makes a second attempt to fulfill an indemnity condition, he, must, he or she must fulfill not only his or her own unfulfilled condition, but in addition, he or she must make restitution for the failures of the people who came before him or her. Method to fulfill indemnity conditions. For anyone to be restored to the original position or state from which he or she fell, he or she must make an indemnity condition by reversing the course of his or her mistake. For instance, because the chosen people reviled Jesus and sent him to the cross, to be saved and restored to the original position of God's elect, the chosen people must go the opposite way which is love Jesus and willingly bear the cross for his sake. You can see that in Luke chapter 14, verse 27. This is the reason Christianity became the religion of martyrdom. Who should make indemnity conditions? Human beings should have become perfect by fulfilling their responsibility. They then would have had the authority to govern even the angels. Yet, the first human ancestors failed in their responsibility and thereby failed, fell to the state where they were dominated by Satan, the fallen angel. Hence, to escape from Satan's dominion, uh, domination and be restored to the state where we rule over him, we ourselves must fulfill the necessary indemnity conditions as our portion of responsibility. So the foundation for the Messiah. The, foundation, the Messiah comes as the true parent of humanity because only he can remove the original sin by giving birth to humanity born of fallen parents. For fallen people to be restored to their original state, we must receive the Messiah whom can, who can re remove our original sin. Before we can re receive the Messiah, however, we must first establish the foundation for the Messiah. What indemnity conditions are required for establishing the foundation for the Messiah? To answer this question, we must first understand how Adam was to have realized the purpose of creation and how he failed to do it. Because the condition of indemnity is made by reversing the course of the deviation from the original path. So the two conditions to realize the purpose of creation. For Adam to realize the purpose of creation, he was supposed to fulfill two conditions. First, Adam should have established the foundation of faith. The person to lay this foundation was Adam himself. The condition to establish this foundation was to keep strictly to God's commandment not to eat of the fruit and pass through a set growing period, which was the time allotted for him 
to fulfill his responsibility. Second, Adam was to establish the foundation of substance. Upon the foundation of faith, he was then to become one with God, thereby establishing the foundation of substance. This means he would have become the perfect incarnation of the word with perfect character, fulfilling God's first blessing. Because Adam fell, he could not establish the foundation of faith. Hence, he could neither become the perfect incarnation of the word, nor complete the purpose of creation. The foundation of faith. Therefore, in order to establish the foundation for the Messiah, fallen people must first restore through indemnity the foundation of faith, which the first human ancestors failed to establish. There are three aspects to the indemnity condition required for restoring the foundation of faith. First, there must be a central figure. God had Cain and Abel offer sacrifices and called men such as Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, the kings, and John the Baptist for the purpose of raising up central figures. Second, an object for the condition must be offered. When Adam lost faith in God, he lost the word of God, given to him as a condition to establish the foundation of faith. As a result, fallen people could no longer directly receive the word and instead had to offer objects for the condition as substitute for the word. Prior to giving, to the giving of the Old Testament, people could establish the foundation of faith by offering a sacrifice or its equivalent, such as Noah's Ark, procured from the natural world. In the Old Testament age, either the word as revealed in the law of Moses or representatives of the word, such as the Ark of the Covenant, the temple, and various central figures served as objects for the condition. In the New Testament age, the word as revealed in the gospels and Jesus, the incarnation of the word were the object for the condition. Third, a numerical period of indemnity must be completed. Okay, the foundation of substance. In order to lay the foundation for the Messiah, we need to establish the foundation of substance on the basis of the foundation of faith. When we receive the Messiah, we can be cleansed of the original sin through him and be restored to the position of the first human ancestors before their fall. After this, a path still remains to be trod. We must become one with the Messiah, centered on the heart of God, then follow him along the uncharted path to the summit of the growing period, and thus finally become perfect incarnations of the word. When the first human ancestors fell and acquired the original sin, they could not realize their God-given original nature. Instead, they harbored the primary characteristics of the fallen nature. By making the indemnity condition to remove the fallen nature, a fallen person can lay the foundation of substance by which he or she can receive the Messiah, be cleansed of the original sin through him, and ultimately restore his or her original nature. The cause of the providence of restoration. The ages in the cause of the providence of restoration. Let us now present an overview of the entire course of history since the time of Adam and survey the providential ages which comprise it. God's providence of restoration began with Adam's family. However, God's will was frustrated when Cain murdered Abel. 10 generations later, the unfulfilled will was passed down to Noah's family. Yet, due to the fall, due to the fallen act of Ham, 
Noah's second son. After the flood judgment, the 10 generations and the 40 days of the flood were lost to Satan. After 400 years had passed, God's will was entrusted to Abraham. Although Abraham failed in the symbolic offering, the family foundation for the Messiah was eventually fulfilled through the three generations of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know, uh, I just want to make a comment. God's work of restoration has been carried out on multiple fronts simultaneously. So basically, this is what we are learning right now. Jeffrey, we're going to go briefly, we're going to go over this. Um, so the 2000 year period from Adam to Abraham was for the purpose of finding one father of faith to lay the foundation to begin the providence of restoration. Thus, God's work of restoration began with Abraham. However, due to Abraham's mistake in making the symbolic offering, the 2000 years from Adam to Abraham were lost to Satan. And the 2000 year period from Abraham to Jesus was set up to restore through indemnity those lost years. When the Jewish people sent Jesus to the cross, the 2000 years from Abraham to Jesus were lost yet again to Satan. Hence, the 2000 year period from Jesus's time until today, second coming of Christ is set up to restore the earlier 2000 year period. Two, categorization of the ages in the course of the providence of restoration. During the 2000 year period from Adam to Abraham, fallen people made indemnity conditions through offering sacrifices, thereby laying the foundation for the next period when God could begin to work his providence based on the word. Hence, this period is called the age of the providence to lay the foundation for the word. During the 2000 year period from Abraham to Jesus, humanity's spirituality and intellect developed to the formation stage based on the word revealed in the Old Testament. Hence, this period is called the formation stage of the providence or the Old Testament age. During the 2000 year period from Jesus to the second coming, humanity's spirituality and intellect developed to the growth stage based on the word revealed in the New Testament. Hence, this period is called the growth stage of the providence or the New Testament age. During the, 2000, during the period when the providence of restoration is to be completed after the second coming of Christ, humanity's spirituality and intellect are to develop through the completion stage based on the completed testament word. Hence, this period is called the completion stage of the providence or the completed testament age. During the 2000 year period, now the age is categorized with reference to God's work of restoration, so of resurrection. During the 2000 year period, from Adam to Abraham, people offered sacrifices to lay the foundation to commence the Old Testament age, when God would begin his work of resurrection. Hence, this period is called the age of the providence to lay the foundation for resurrection. During the 2000 year period from Abraham to Jesus, people could be resurrected to the form spirit level based on the Old Testament word and the merit of the age in the providence of restoration. Hence, this period is called the age of the providence of formation stage resurrection. During the 2000 year period from Jesus to the second coming, people could be resurrected to the life spirit level based on the New Testament word and the merit of the age in the providence of restoration. Hence, 
This period is called the age of the providence of growth stage resurrection. During the period when the providence of restoration is to be completed after the second coming of Christ, people are to be fully resurrected to the divine spirit level based on the completed testament word and the merit of the age in the providence of restoration. Hence, this period is called the age of the providence of completion stage resurrection. Now, the age is categorized with reference to the providence to restore through indemnity the lost period of faith. So uh, just a small comment. Uh, we can also see that the way God has worked is that he does not leave uh, anything unfinished. You know, if there is unfinished business, he will try to fulfill it either with the next person or in the next period. So that's how God has worked throughout the providence. So we are just, we are just laying the foundation uh, you know, so that we can be able to be, you know, so that we can be equipped with the foundation that can allow us to understand God's providence when we start studying it. So uh, we go on during the 2000 year period from Abraham to Jesus, God restored through indemnity the, the previous period of 2000 years, 2000 years lost to Satan due to Abraham's mistake in the symbolic offering by working predominantly through the people of Israel. Hence, this period is called the age of the providence of restoration through indemnity. During the 2000 year period from Jesus to the second coming, God has been restoring the Old Testament age lost to Satan due to Jesus' crucifixion by working predominantly through Christianity. Hence, this period is called the age of the prolongation of the providence of restoration through indemnity. During the period when the providence of restoration is to be completed after the second coming of Christ, God will work to restore the entire course of the providence of restoration which had been lost to Satan. Hence, this period is called the age for completing the providence of restoration through indemnity. Now we move on to the ages categorized with reference to expanding, to the expanding scope of the foundation for the Messiah. During the 2000 year period from Adam to Abraham, God laid the family foundation for the Messiah by raising up Abraham's family on the condition of the sacrifices they offered. Hence, this period is called the age of the providence to lay the family foundation for the Messiah. During the 2000 year period from Abraham to Jesus, God worked to lay the national foundation for the Messiah by raising up Israel based on the Old Testament word. Hence, this period is called the age of the providence to lay the national foundation for the Messiah. During the 2000 year period from Jesus to the second coming, God has been laying the worldwide foundation for the Messiah by raising up worldwide Christianity based on the New Testament word. Hence, this period is called the age of the providence to lay the worldwide foundation for the Messiah. During the period when the providence of restoration is to be completed, after the second coming of Christ, God will complete the cosmic foundation for the Messiah by working through heaven and earth based on the completed testament word. Hence, this period is called the age of the providence to complete the cosmic foundation for the Messiah. Now we're gonna see the age is categorized by uh, with reference to responsibility. During the 2000 year period from Adam to Abraham, God laid the foundation upon which to conduct the, his providence in the subsequent Old Testament age, a providence which was to be fulfilled by God, shouldering the responsibility. Hence, this period is called the age of the providence to lay the foundation for God's responsibility. 
During the 2000 year period from Abraham to Jesus, God took responsibility as a creator of human beings and carried out the providence of restoration at the formation stage. God worked with the prophets and personally shouldered the first responsibility to defeat Satan. Hence, this period is called the age of the providence based on God's responsibility. During the 2000 year period from Jesus to the second coming, Jesus and the Holy Spirit who assumed the missions of Adam and Eve have conducted the providence of restoration at the growth stage, shouldering the, the second responsibility to defeat Satan. Hence this period is called the age of the providence based on Jesus and the Holy Spirit's responsibility. During the period when the providence of restoration is to be completed after the second coming of Christ, the people of faith are to bear the third responsibility to defeat Satan and complete the providence of restoration. Hence, this period is called the age of the providence based on the believer's responsibility. Now, the age is categorized with reference to the parallels in the providence. During the 2000 year period from Adam to Abraham, the foundation for the Messiah was restored by fulfilling parallel indemnity conditions of a symbolic type. Hence, this period is called the age of symbolic parallels. During the 2000 year period from Abraham to Jesus, the foundation for the Messiah was restored by fulfilling parallel indemnity conditions on an, of an image type. Hence, this period is called the age of image parallels. During the 2000 year period from Jesus to the second coming, the foundation for the Messiah has been restored by fulfilling parallel indemnity conditions of a substantial type. Hence, this period is called the age of substantial parallels. Now, we have studied how God has, you know, just in brief, how briefly how God has worked throughout history. We're gonna see that later more. But also, did God only work with those people or God will also be working with me? So now we're gonna focus on the history of the providence of restoration and I, where do I fit? You know, this is just, again, we're just gonna touch up briefly on this. Uh, as an individual, I, meaning each and every one of us, am a product of the history of the providence of restoration, hence, I must take up the cross of history and accept responsibility to fulfill its calling. To this end, I must fulfill in my lifetime, horizontally, through my efforts, the indemnity conditions which have accumulated through the long history of the providence of restoration, which is vertical, you know, looking at it vertically. Only by doing this can I stand proudly as a fruit of history, the one whom God has eagerly sought throughout his providence. To become a historical victor. To become such a historical victor, I must understand clearly God's heart. When he worked with past prophets and saints, the original purpose for which God called them and the details of the providential mission which he entrusted to them. We must understand all these things through Christ at the second advent who comes to fulfill the providence of restoration. Moreover, when we believe in him, become one with him and attend him in his work, we can stand in the position of having fulfilled horizontally with him, the vertical indemnity conditions in the history of the providence of restoration. The path which all past saints walked as they strove to fulfill God's providential will is the very path we must walk again today. Beyond that, we must continue on to the end of the path. Even walking trails they left untrodden. Therefore, 
Fallen people can never find a path that leads to light without understanding the particulars of the providence of restoration. Herein lies the reason why we must study the principle of restoration in detail. Thank you very much for giving me the chance to read for you today. Excellent, excellent presentation, Minister Christian and Seika. Thank you so much. And we are blessed on this platform to have our national co-chair of the American Clergy Leadership Conference, Dr. Luan Abram Rouse with us tonight to begin looking at what you just presented to us and, and uh, really uh, making profound comments on it, as he will also include other clergy that are here on the call tonight to do just that. Let us then welcome up uh, Dr. Luan Rouse. Dr. Hernandez, thank you so much. And I'm going to be turning to you and to Bishop Jesse Edwards, um, really, for your comments tonight. And of course, the Edwards couple, I think you informed me, are here. And both of them are welcome to speak. One voice speaks, the other speaks. So Bishop Edwards will, will guide uh, Dr. Edwards into conversating. I know sometimes she hesitate, but Bishop, you got her tonight. Now put her under some control. <laughs> Just teasing women, don't get upset. I see Reverend Katulik laughing already. She knows I'm going to get Dr. Rouse in Korea about that one, right? <laughs> but listen, thank you, Reverend Christian and Sika. You are always on point at the right time to lead us into areas of understanding. I, I want to make comments on what you presented tonight in a way in keeping with a work that I'm doing for the Unification Theological Seminary, looking at the comparison of the unification faith into the world religion. And tonight I want to take this key ideology of the unification faith and place it into the traditional theology. And if everyone bear with me, I will end my statements showing just that. And then I will call on both Reverend uh, Dr. Hernandez and the Edwards couple. So everybody go along with me. This is a work in process, but we want to get it to the world so that all of the world will accept the work of true parents. As was stated, the unification, restoration, indemnity condition. I like the way that was read and highlighted tonight. It, it is conceptually from the beginning, I believe with Reverend Moon in 1954, it's always been a part of the experience as he would bring it to the world as a spiritual principle that must be fulfilled in order to restore the relationship between God and humanity. I believe that's what I heard being lifted up very powerfully tonight as Reverend and Sika brought this to us, which of course, we remember this relationship was damaged as we study it in the fall of first man and first woman in the Garden of Eden. So the indemnity condition involves fulfilling certain spiritual conditions, such as making spiritual offerings and practicing sincere devotion in order to in indemnify or make up the mistakes of humanity and restore the original relationship between God and humanity. Now, if people will follow this, I would say, uh, Reverend Nsika, then they won't get caught up in like we are making payment. You know, it's like this is a repentance process and we are turning around to get into this right relationship with God because humanity did make a mistake. The other thing that I heard tonight was if we place it in the context 
of traditional theology, such as being born again, uh, justification and sanctification, we must do so without abandoning the uh, indemnity condition. The indemnity condition is necessary, as I would conclude in the end, to really grasping born again justification and sanctification, I would say, to fulfill the requirements for salvation and spiritual growth. Salvation and spiritual growth. Justification is the process of being declared righteous by God through faith in Jesus Christ. And I heard Reverend Nsika saying very clearly that Father Moon says there is a foundation there with that faith in Jesus Christ. While sanctification is the ongoing process of spiritual growth and transformation. So when we are sanctified, no matter what it is that we gain by our faith in Jesus, on the in-between of our faith and getting to what I would use in unification terms, true, uh, true obedience, there has to be true love. We have to come back to truly loving God and trusting in God. And therefore that transformation from being in the grasp of sin needs to be in the fullness of true love. Therefore, by fulfilling the, the unification, restoration, indemnity condition, believers can demonstrate their faith and devotion to God. And through the grace of God, they can be justified and sanctified. That's why I'm putting it together, Reverend Sika, that, that we need the indemnity process to put ourselves to work. Otherwise, we think we're on a welfare system. <laughs> that grace is a welfare system and God is doing it all and just giving us this justification and sanctification. But they come with God's grace when we demonstrate a faith and devotion to God. So we're not buying it, no, but we are demonstrating to God that we are ready to be restored into that right relationship with God. We're not playing a game with God. We are really ready. So in this way, it's where I want to conclude. And then uh, Dr. Hernandez, I'll go to Bishop Edwards first. Then Bishop Edwards will, will bring in Dr. Edwards if they agree to that. That couple will have to agree to that. I'm just throwing it out there, teasing a little bit, but Bishop Edwards, you do as you're led by the Spirit. And then I will turn to you, Dr. Hernandez, before we close. But here's my, my conclusion in this. That with unification, restoration, indemnity condition, what can be seen is a complement to the traditional theology. That's what I want the world to hear. It complements traditional theology. So outreaches who may be here, or other ministers who may be here, when you're talking to other Christians or ministers who have not understood this yet, we can easily say that the teachings of true parents complement the traditional theology of born again and justification and sanctification as it provides a specific set of conditions and practices that can help believers to grow spiritually and deepen their relationship with God, then we can get there. Now, you may wonder, well, Dr. Ross, how, how is this a big transformation shift? Because if you've been following us, right, Bishop Edwards, we've been saying you've got to come our way first. 
Yes. God, come to Jesus. Father Moon said, come to Jesus. And then we say, then you need to come to this indemnity condition. And people say, well, why, why, why? Because it's incomplete. Just having the faith and receiving the grace is an incomplete process. We must show God a readiness for the fullness of the sanctification that God places upon us to come again and live as true children of God with true love and true obedience to God. And then I'll see you in glory land. Bishop Jesse Edwards, take it from there. <laughs> wow, Dr. Rouse, I don't know what anyone else could say. You made it plain and just put it right on the line. Chris, you did a great job. Miss seeing you every week in New York, my brother. You're looking young. How come you don't get old like me? I don't know what that is. It must be indemnity. That's what it is. You paid the price of indemnity. I don't know why any Christian would have any problem with indemnity. The greatest, most powerful, most Wonderful indemnity we can read in the word is Jesus giving his life at Calvary. You know, it wasn't enough, Dr. Rouse, for him to walk with God by faith, by the word, by love. He had an unconditional love for God, his father. He said, listen, I don't do anything unless my father tells me. Boy, if we can learn to walk like that, Chris, uh, we wouldn't even need police in New York City. Wouldn't that be great? Wow, you have that unconditional love for God. And then Jesus led that life. Everything in his life represented God. That's why he could say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He had an unconditional love. But the greatest thing, I think, in Jesus' indemnity was his unconditional obedience. Total, 100% obedience to the Father. Boy, if we can learn that, we won't have any problem. The problem we have in Christianity that I've seen, uh, Dr. Rouse, in 50, I don't know, over 50 years of ministry. Goodness, I've been married 53 years. By the way, June is 54. How do you like that one? I'm getting old. Speak louder, folks. I can't hear you. So when we get to the point that we realize all the faith we have is good, but faith without substance of that condition, faith without substance. What did you, what did the word say? Show me your faith without works, but I'll show you my faith by my works. That substantial thinking, believing, honest report with God, but then giving up substantial. The reason people don't make it very long in their religious experience, they think they can only make it on faith. And that's a good foundation. It's a great beginning. But we have to have some substantial offering of ourselves. Whatever way we make that with God, there must be a substantial offering. You know what, brothers and sisters, if Adam, Adam and Eve hadn't failed, we wouldn't have to worry about indemnity. We have to redeem the loss of God's word in the garden and sanctify ourselves so that we can become what God intended Adam to be in the garden. Boy, I could go on all night long, but I know our clock is getting out of here, and I can, I think this is beautiful. Thank you, Dr. Rouse, for bringing Chosen to us. Thank you, folks, for bringing, reading, studying, and all of you that are here every week. God bless you. Good job again, Chris. Thank you, Bishop Edwards. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for the word. Thank you for spreading that word as our evangelists across America and good fruit coming. I heard in the presentation tonight uh, referring to us as fruit, the fruit of history. Yes. Listen, fruitful people, God bless you. Remember, God loves you. Marie and I love you. Everybody on this call, let's just love one another the way that yes. God intended to be. Dr. Hernandez, you have the last word tonight. And when you give it, afterwards, lead us in prayer. Oh, my heavens. You know, this time of year, uh, I've been reflecting on it a lot because as a young person, I think I've shared with y'all before, I was raised Catholic. And uh, for me, the most precious time of the year was Lent. Mm -hmm. I really appreciated 
of course, in unification terms, we might say I was making an indemnity condition or something like that. But I would beforehand, I would pray and reflect, and then I would sacrifice something. I would give up something that was uh, a treat for me or something that I really enjoyed and and offer it up to, to God just so I could more get closer to my Lord Jesus, to really get closer to him. So what you were saying, true, Dr. Rouse, is that indemnity conditions, we have to look at them as how beautiful they are because they help us to cultivate relationship. Mm -hmm. Not just say it's all on Jesus, it's all on yes. Jesus, but what if I do something? What if I fast? What go. if I pray? What if I show devotion, right? Because I want to draw closer to my Lord. Come on, I'm Mark, walk good. in the garden with him, right? <laughs> to me, yeah. that's that's what uh, we have to really look at indemnity conditions at because you're not going to lose. No you're way. not going to lose with an indemnity condition. You're going to try to sanctify your heart and prepare yourself. Yes. Right? We know that there are people what who go to church early. Why do they go to early? Are they setting an indemnity condition? No. <laughs> Maybe you could say so. But they're going there early to get their mind, their spirit in the house of the Lord prepare themselves to hear God's word, mm. right? If I just jump in the car and race over there and I get there five minutes late, how much preparation have I done to receive God's word? How much preparation have I done? So for me, Lent as a young person was always so precious. It continues to be a precious time for me because it affords me an opportunity together with the body of Christ. You know, I'm not checking on my neighbors to see what they're offering, but it's an opportunity. It's an invitation. To, to make a condition of devotion or a condition of indemnity. And we know in our own personal relationships with one another, as, as uh, Minister Inseka was talking about, in the very beginning, the setup of indemnity and describing what that is, if I break relationship with you, Bishop Edwards, then what is it? Can I just come back to you and say, Jesse, I'm sorry. Oh. I'm just sorry, Jesse. No, I have to make a lot more effort than that because your heart, you're God's child, you're God's son. And I wronged you, right? That's right. That's right. So then to the depth, you can feel if I'm genuine or not, right? You can feel if I'm genuine or not, Yes. right? So my praying and fasting and preparation to come to you and praying that God will be able to work through that to open your heart, you know, it's the same thing. Look at the, look at the wisdom. Of course, that's Old Testament age, but look at the wisdom of Jacob, right? In returning to see his brother Esau. What did he do? Did he just walk up there and say, hey, you saw, accept me for what I am, you know, your brother who really wronged you and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm coming back. So open your arms. No, he didn't do that. He sincerely considered his brother's situation. Yes. Right. And he sent all of his livestock and all of his slaves ahead and told them to bow to the ground of his brother. Wow. Right. And tell them, tell his brother they belong to him now. Jesus. You know, we, there's so much, we can, we can take this jaded look at indemnity and think we're paying some kind of price, but <laughs> if, what did we see our Lord do? Mm. Yeah. We just, we just celebrated his resurrection and we just, you know, bowed our heads on Good Friday and thanked him for his incredible sacrifice. Yeah. Someone could say, well, wasn't that first beating enough? And then he had to get beaten again. And then he had to get beaten again. And then he had to be crucified. Mm. But every stage of that, what did he do? Our Lord went to the world of heart mm. and only wanted to be an obedient offering to his father. And, and be obedient all the way, and then have the heart to forgive us. Just incredible, incredible. We have to look at indemnity from the world of heart, from the world of relationships, not just from external looking at it. You know, um, one of my favorite stories in the Bible, of course, is, is of Job. Job is a Gentile. Job is not Jewish. Job is, Job, he doesn't have a Jewish lineage at all. But he's considered an upright man, a man who fears God, a man who, who shuns evil. And he, he's been blessed. He's blessed with family. He's best at economics. 
And Satan is so determined. Satan is so confident that if that is taken away, so will Job's faith in God. And that story sees a man layer by layer paying indemnity. But getting the victory because he never forsakes, he never forsakes God. And of course, Satan gives up. But, you know, uh, I am so grateful. And I was also grateful for you, Minister Enseca, because at the beginning, you, you, you expressed the reality that in the principle of creation, had Adam and Eve not fallen, human beings would still have a portion of responsibility. Yeah. Human beings would still have to go through a process of growth, growth you know, formation, growth, and, and maturity and perfection. We wouldn't be exempt from those things and be able to be the masters of creation. We would have to go through the steps of being fruitful, maturing ourselves so that we're worthy and we're, we, we can ex receive this amazing blessing of God to have a holy marriage, right? And then on the foundation of our individual maturity and perfection and oneness with God's heart, our oneness with our, 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 our spouse in holy matrimony, then we could be really people who... Uh, who would strive to govern the creation with the love of God so that creation would not complain, the great creation would not be groaning, the creation would be reveling. Yes. yes. So, yeah, those are some of my reflections tonight. Thank you so much, Minister Seca. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rouse, because it's true. It's a compliment to traditional yes. theology. Yes. Um, and the Bible, you know, the Bible is filled, the New Testament age is filled with stories of fasting and praying and vigils right? Why? Because those help to accentuate and prepare our hearts to meet God in a very real, sincere way, because God is always sincere. But me, I'm fickle. I don't know about you. I'm fickle sometimes. But I, so I need to make indemnity conditions or set conditions of devotion to to open my eyes, my ears. Yeah. I love that song, Open the Eyes of My Heart, Lord. Yeah. So, yes. Let us pray now as we conclude our chosen for tonight. Thank you. Our loving Heavenly Father, our loving Heavenly Parent, we thank you. Our Lord Jesus, we thank you for your living example. You are alive with us. And we thank you that you touched on Easter, early Easter morning in 1935, you reached a young man, Sun Myung Moon, and you began a process of revealing to him the work yet undone, the work that you, the full picture of the work you had come to do 2,000 years before. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. We're living in the age when you are becoming clearer and clearer to us, plainer and plainer to us, Heavenly Parent, so that we really can irrefutably know that we are made in your image, male and female. And we can look at history and, oh my heavens, heavenly parent, we can see that you never have abandoned us. You never have abandoned your ideal. Thank you, thank you. You have purposed and you will do it. You have spoken and you will bring it to pass, heavenly parent. We thank you so much, dear God. Thank you so much, dear God, for this uh, exp this. Uh, Exposition of the divine principle, this exposition of revelation Jesus gave directly to Father and Mother. We thank you so much for this time that we've had today. We pray that uh, during this period of time, when we know our Lord was on the earth, he is still on the earth, working through his, his sons and daughters, just as we just learned right now, right? The history of the providence of restoration and I, I, it's not just in the past, that you used amazing men and women of faith, but you need us now. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Mother, we thank you so much that we can be gathered on this program. We pray that we, within this week, we can really live out this truth and we can be people who are, who are cognizant of the, the reality that we live in, that we live in a time that you still need me, Heavenly Parent, and I definitely need you. I definitely want to be open to your will and, and be a vessel for your will 
to be accomplished. Thank you so much for everyone's attentive ear, for their attentive heart, for their attentive eyes. Thank you for our presenter. Thank you for the commentary. We offer this all up to you in our Lord Jesus' name and all of our names as your sons and daughters. Amen and adieu. Adieu. Thank you, everyone. Wow. Thank you so much, Minister and Zeka. Thank you for opening prayer, Apostle Glenda Phillips Lee. It's always so precious to be opened in prayer by you. And thank you, everyone. Thank you, Bishop Edwards, for your commentary tonight. Uh, give our love to Dr. Tanya Edwards. And I see on the call with us our Vice President of the American Clergy Leadership Conference. Wow. Archbishop Solange Lewis. There. Salute. And she's together with our, uh, all, we have all of our three co-chairs for women in ministry, Dr. Rako Jenkins, uh, Mr. Marilyn Kotelek, and of course, Archbishop Solange Lewis. Thank you for being with us tonight. God bless you all. Thank you. If I missed any of the clergy on the call, please forgive me. I also want to mention uh, hallelujah to Carmen Alexis Silvia. She's always the first one on the call. How Thank are you? you How are you? <laughs> How are you, family? How are yeah. you? Thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you for making this your family. God bless you, everyone, tonight. Have a blessed week. Reverend Mark, our brother. God bless everyone. Thank you so much. Love you, family. God bless you, girl. Love you. God bless you. Be blessed. Dr. Rako, God bless. Good to see you tonight. Hey, Dr. Rako Jenkins, how are you? God bless you, St Sandra Stevenson. God bless you. Amen. Hi, Carmen. God bless you, and so do I. Be blessed. Good night. Thank you, Gail. Thank you, Tilly. Love you. Good night, Sandra. Good night, family. God bless. Good night. Thank you, Dr. Ralph. Bye.